When I was in fifth grade in Portland, Oregon, I was on the third floor of my elementary school, which was a brick building, and there was a 6-8 Nisqually earthquake. I just remember the overhead projector swinging and hitting the ceiling. And a 6-8 isn't a very big earthquake. Those happen every week somewhere on Earth. There's a magnitude 6. Growing up in the Northwest, we did earthquake drills. So we knew exactly what to do, right? Get under the, the table and crouch, but it's so much more real when the actually Earth is shaking. Second base, so the Oakland A's take... Take... Hang on, we're having an earthquake. Oh my God, we're having an earthquake. Wait a minute, hold on, hold on. And so it, it really scared me. So that was basically where my interest in seismology came from. The people of Seattle are digging out today from the region's most powerful earthquake in 52 years. Waking in the fervent hope that there will be someone alive in there. The more concerning thing to the average person isn't what the earth is made of, but tsunamis, for example. So 2004, the Sumatra tsunami killed over 225,000 people. So that's a more pressing issue to the average person than, for example, the origin of the earth. But the cool thing of seismology is it can answer both of these questions. What sort of earthquakes cause tsunamis? What kind of hazards do we have? But also, what is the origin of our Earth? What is it made of and what's its place in, in the solar system? Seismology is the study of how the Earth moves all sorts of things make the Earth move. The oceans make the Earth move, the wind makes the Earth move, often earthquakes make the Earth move. And so we study those mechanical vibrations and then we use that information to learn something about the inside of the Earth. After a large earthquake, the Earth will wobble, it'll jiggle for several days. And seismologists use the various frequencies of these motions to basically study things from the surface down to the core. There's, you know, animal noises, you know, whales in the ocean are doing calls, you have ship traffic and things like this, and you have all this noise. The, the ocean is just this incredibly noisy place. And so that is kind of, a lot of people wonder, you know, how the heck can you distinguish, you know, earthquake signals from all this other stuff? And that's one of the things that, yeah, like, it's really amazing, but it's actually not that complicated because we know a lot about the frequency content of earthquakes, and if you know what frequencies you're looking for, you can kind of dial in on those and say, okay, ignore everything else, let's just pay attention to things that are at these periods and these frequencies. We tend to already look at seismic grounds when we know that there's been an earthquake. So this is a seismic record when we know that there was an earthquake happening fairly close to Princeton, and this is the record we got from the seismometer in our basement in this very building in Gear Hall. When we know the earthquake had happened, still the seismometer doesn't move anywhere because the energy hasn't got from the earthquake location all the way over here. But then we see some dramatic wiggles start to happen and we really do call them wiggles. The first energy we get arriving is nearly always the P wave energy. Then we see all sorts of other wiggles on our waveform. These are different sorts of seismic waves coming in. Sometimes they've traveled through different routes through the earth. So instead of coming straight here, they've maybe gone down, bounced off something in the deep earth, and come back up. So even just in one seismogram, you're really seeing lots of different information about lots of different pieces of the Earth. And this is just from one earthquake recorded right here in Princeton. We have had 46,000 some odd seismometers put on land. And I can count the number of deployments of seismometers in the oceans. It's tiny, it's expensive, it's hard to do. Then you look at the map of the Earth and you see most of the stations, most of the recording stations, the seismometers are on land and we need to go to the ocean. Let's not go all the way down to the bottom. Let's not build the fanciest seismometer, but let's just record the sounds in the water that are echoes of earthquake waves. You rely on the water to propagate that energy to you acoustically. The key to the mermaid is that it's only deployed, but it's not recovered. Because as the instrument records data that are deemed to be good, based on onboard uh, processing, it waits till the right time and then comes up and reports the data through us via satellite. There are earthquakes in places that had never been recorded. Those are typically small, shallow, 
ocean floor earthquakes that tell us something about the tectonics of the ocean floor, where the faults are, what they do, what sort of rates of energy dissipation you get when uh, they grind past each other and produce these earthquakes. So the design of Mermaid is that it's a glass sphere which has all our instruments in it and protects the instruments from the pressure of the ocean. There's a hydrophone which is just an underwater microphone that listens to sounds. And then there's a, um, an adjustable buoyancy. Basically, it's a, a bladder, a hydraulic bladder. When the mermaid resurfaces, it has a transmitter that basically will transmit its GPS coordinates. We're waiting, waiting, and we're like, okay, it's supposed to come, it's supposed to come. When, when's it gonna tell us it's alive, you know? Pretty much right on time, we get this message. It's like, oh, here's the coordinates. All right, and we all run to the captain. We tell him, okay, these are the coordinates. Like, let's punch them in. Let's start, you know, heading in that direction. We start sending the boat off, and then as we're going, the instrument actually updates its location, I think, every five minutes. We started heading in one direction, and then a few minutes later, it moved a little bit, and so it was this game of like, okay, we're getting closer, we're getting closer, and then as we were um, really, you know, narrowing in on the location, we basically had the whole crew on all sides of the boat looking out at sea, trying to find this thing just kind of bobbing up and down in the ocean. Finally, we actually, you know, someone sees it, it's like, oh, it's over there, it's over there, let's go. We had gotten lucky that there was actually a pretty small earthquake, I think it was on the order of magnitude 5 or so, in um, northern Japan while the instrument was deployed and it actually recorded it. And so we actually had some earthquake data um, to look at from this very, very brief deployment. Essentially a microphone floating at a kilometer and a half down under the ocean surface and kilometer up from the ocean floor is indeed recording arrivals from very distant, very disparate type of earthquakes all around the world. If you wanted to sort of, you know, make a sale and show a proof of concept, I think it was the best case scenario. <laughs>Techniques that were originally developed in seismology, mainly for exploration geophysics to explore hydrocarbon reservoirs or in earthquake seismology to image the Earth interior on a continental scale or a global scale are now being used to do medical imaging or non-destructive testing using ultrasound. In classical ultrasound, like if you've seen what images look like, say, of a growing fetus or something like that, these are sort of grayscale images that highlight contrasts in the medium. And it's quite amazing what you can see, but what you see ultimately is a qualitative picture of variations of something but there's nothing quantitative about it. I could not put my finger on the image and say, well, this rep represents this physical characteristic of, of, of the object. What we do in seismic imaging is much more quantitative in that we solve an equation that governs the propagation of these ultrasound waves through this object. And from that, we can extract material properties that control that process and then use that quantitative information together to make a diagnosis. These values can only take on certain levels depending on what you're dealing with. If it's bone, if it's skin, if it's a blood vessel, if it's a tumor. Well, it's still ultrasound, so it's relatively inexpensive compared to other things. Uh, it, compared to an x-ray, it's, it's, it's of course less, less invasive. Uh, compared to an MRI, 
it's much less expensive. So there are opportunities to take ultrasound to a new level too. It's, it's not just about the sort of typical ultrasound that you might use, say, to look at a fetus or in particular for mammography, so breast cancer and screening and imaging. But you might imagine using ultrasound for things that are currently considered to be too difficult for ultrasound, like uh, looking at the brain or maybe imaging a knee or a, or a limb. Uh, so we, we are cautiously optimistic that these techniques can actually be used for problems that they're not traditionally used for. That's the idea. The first planet that we've explored seismically was Earth. That seems fairly obvious. The next place we explored seismically was the Moon. The Apollo mission put some seismometers on the Moon. We see moonquakes. We see artificial impact and natural impact, stuff that's been flung at the surface of the Moon. But the next planet to explore has always been Mars. We've always been fascinated by the Red Planet. And so in 2018, the InSight mission launched. It sent some geophysical instruments to Mars. It was a very risky mission because it was a one-shot deal. Lander came into the Martian atmosphere and it was going to land where it was going to land. There's very little room to maneuver. And so now we have a seismometer on Mars. It has been placed on the Martian surface. It's currently covered by a, a heat shield and a windshield. And we're waiting for Mars quakes. On the surface of Mars, we're sitting and listening right now. Mars is not a completely dead planet. We see volcanic provinces on Mars. We see topographic differences on Mars. So the landscape on the Northern Hemisphere of Mars is quite different to the landscape on the Southern Hemisphere of Mars. We see hints of quake-like features on the surface of Mars. So places where there's been higher stress and material might have moved a bit closer together. Places where there's been lower stress and material might have moved a bit further apart from each other. These could have generated Mars quakes. The other thing which might generate useful signals on Mars are impacts. If we get a piece of space debris flying out of the asteroid belt and it hits the surface of Mars, it will generate seismic signals. If we see those seismic waves coming from some sort of impactor, we could work out the properties of the interior of Mars. One possibility is to do seismology on the Sun. Uh, it's called helioseismology. And uh, the luxury there is that you can observe the solar surface and see half the, the Sun from Earth. And by looking at the surface of the Sun and looking at the Doppler shifts of the motion of elements of the surface, you can, it's like having a little seismometer at every little pixel of, of the solar surface. And the way people study the interior of the Sun is by using something called noise cross-correlation, where you take the time series of motion at one pixel of the solar surface and you cross-correlate it with the time series of motion at another pixel. And when you do that magically, mathematically, the impulse response of the wave propagation between those sites emerges. So it's like having a sunquake going off at one location and recording it at the other. And that's just the process of cross-correlation. And we use that on Earth very effectively now. And we also use it uh, as a principal way of making measurements on the sun. There are a few different things that I would always want people to take away from a discussion of seismology. The first thing is very much from a science teacher's perspective. So even though we can't directly see into the Earth, we can use seismic waves to look for different things inside the Earth, just like a doctor would use X-rays or ultrasound to look inside a person. And even though the Earth is very wide, we can look at seismic waves which have traveled the entire way through the Earth, bounced off something and traveled the whole way back. So we can see with increasingly better resolution things which we would expect to be hidden. Something I often talk about with general audiences is, if there's an earthquake, what should you do? Should you run screaming out of a building? No, please don't do that. <laughs> Instead, what you should do if there's an earthquake is drop and cover and hold. So get onto the floor, try and get under something sturdy, or put your hands over your head and just hold on till the shaking's finished. And if I've taught somebody that, maybe it doesn't teach about the wonders of science, but maybe it'll keep them safer in the future.